Hi, my name is Rick and we're going to look at a slideshow of a cruise my wife and I took in February 2020. I know the bad news is that it's pictures and not a video, but the good news is you won't have to look at all 1,428 pictures that we took. We decided to take a winter cruise this year, but we didn't go here. This February we went here. Where is here? It's Alta, Norway. Never heard of Alta? Not many people have. We also went to Bergen on the trip, and I'm sure in the future we'll run into fellow travelers who've been there. But I doubt we'll run into many people who have even heard of Alta, let alone visited there. Alta is 248 miles north of the Arctic Circle and only 1,380 miles from the North Pole. That's the distance from the middle of Kansas to Baltimore, not even as far as Denver. This is a map of our trip. The numbers by each city give the order that we visited them. The trip was called In Search of the Northern Lights, so we spent six days north of the Arctic Circle. As you'll see in the pictures, most of the trip was overcast, but luckily we had clear skies for viewing the lights four of the six nights. Three of the four were on the ship, but the night on land was spectacular. There are two cities which have strange pronunciations. I always pronounce stop one as Bodo, but it's pronounced as Buddha, like the fat philosopher from India. The other is stop two. I always pronounce the last O with the slash through it as a long O, but it's really ah, so it's Trump sa. When the O with the slash is at the end of the word, it means island, and Tromso is an island. But assuming most of you don't have a Norwegian background, I'm pronouncing them Bodo and Tromso. Day 1, London. We stayed one night in London at one of the hotels near Heathrow Airport. Look at how close the runway is. We didn't know how close until we looked out the window the next morning. The windows were soundproof and we never heard a thing. That afternoon we boarded the ship for the cruise. Days 2 and 3 at sea. The weather was so bad we skipped our first stop, Stavanger. Can you tell how rough the seas were that day? The land at the horizon was typical of the coastline. The weather was so overcast most of the time, so the land often looked like black and white photos. There was little color, but, after all, it was February in Norway. Day 4 at Sea It took one and a half days to travel from southern Norway to the cities in the north. There were only a few villages on the coast. This tiny village is near Rorvik. We were so excited. This was our first sighting of a snow-covered mountain. We were surprised that none of the mountains and lands right at the coast had much snow. The Gulf Stream from the Gulf of Mexico travels across the Atlantic Ocean and up the west coast of Norway. That's why the land along the coast is warmer than in the interior and the ports don't freeze up. Just south of Bodo, we crossed the Arctic Circle, and all the passengers were inducted into the worldwide Order of the Blue Nose. It's a great organization. No meetings, no duties, and no dues. This is the sunset while we were heading to Bodo. Passengers could sign up to get phone calls during the night if the crew on the bridge saw the northern lights. We got a call that night. It was our first sighting of the Northern Lights and they weren't very prominent. This picture was taken from our stateroom balcony while the ship was in open seas. Not a very solid perch, but we were glad to see them because you don't know if you'll get a chance to see them again. Day 5, Bodo. We are now traveling into the port of Bodo and we are passing more hills as we get closer to the city. We didn't need the little lighthouses to guide us in. It was a beautiful day, so the hills weren't just black and white. Downtown Bodo was right next to the dock, so it was easy to see from our ship's deck. The city is proud of the fact that it is the northernmost city on the railroad from Bergen. More businesses and factories were farther out from the downtown. 
We visited the Norwegian Maritime Museum and learned about a different aspect of the Vikings, not as warriors, but as traders. Even though this boat is only 40 feet long, the view from the floor is quite imposing. The Vikings had to sail within sight of the rocky shore as there was no navigation equipment. With the pictures you've seen of the rugged coastline, can you imagine how dangerous it was to sail in these waters? It still is. Last year, in 2019, this same cruise was caught in a storm, some of the engines failed, and half the passengers had to be rescued by helicopter. Walk around to the back of the museum and you'll see this pretty scene near Bodo. That night, at about 10 p.m., we were notified that the Aurora Borealis was visible. A visit to the top deck revealed that it wasn't any better than the night before, so I went back to my room. At about 2 a.m., a phone call alerted us that it was visible again. Many passengers decided once enough night was enough, but I put on my Norway clothes and went back up. The lights were more active and visible. We were still on the ship and everyone was crowded together, but good photos were possible. This is another picture from that night. After I was done, I raced back to the room and woke my wife up. I was hoping that she could get a chance to see some good Aurora activity before it went away, and she did. Day 6, Tromso. The next two pictures are of the coast. It was another sunny day and the scenery was beautiful. These are the views we were hoping to see. This view of the rugged coastline shows more detail than some of the other pictures. What a difference a sunny day makes. Here's our first look at the port of Tromso. The city has three sections. The port and downtown scene here are on a very large island, the western section of the city. The bridge on the right is going to the island of Tromso, where the buildings and city are older. It's the central section of the three. A short bridge to the east takes you to the mainland and the eastern section of the city. This photo shows part of the downtown and city on the western part of Tromso. Those Norwegians are so clever. They combined a very sloped roof and a decorative gutter with a slick roofing material to get rid of the snow with no work. That night I went on a photo safari to see the northern lights. We spent two hours watching and photographing them and they are spectacular. It is really impossible to describe what it's like to be there. You generally face north. That night the northern lights extended from the eastern horizon up and over to the western horizon and from the northern horizon straight before us to a little past overhead. My pictures are still pictures, but the lights are all moving all the time. This picture shows some constellations as humans, animals, birds, and serpents. Imagine if all those creatures were moving. Sometimes they wiggle in their own area, sometimes they crawl over each other, sometimes they play with other creatures, and sometimes they change into other shapes. Now imagine they are not creatures, but the northern lights. The lights are dynamic. These three pictures were taken just seconds apart. You can see the progression of the movement and the changing shape of the lights from picture to picture. Some of my other pictures are in this collage. The aurora starts out with a burst of energy from the sun that reaches the earth in about three days. The colors depend on which elements in the atmosphere the sun's energy reacts with. Photos of the Aurora Borealis are certainly colorful. With greens, reds, and purples filling the sky, the Aurora looks almost too colorful. And that's because it is. We can't see them with the naked eye, but the colors are real. The human eye sees colors poorly in dim light. A time exposure with a camera collects much more light and reveals the colors to us. This picture compares a naked eye view and a camera photo of the same Aurora. In the naked eye view, the aurora looks milky white or gray. This is a still photo and it certainly isn't an inspiration, 
But remember that there are many, many sections of the aurora covering the sky, some large, some small, but they are all moving. It's a truly breathtaking sight. Day 7, Tromso, Day 2. The early morning sun casts shadows on the central section of the city, Tromso Island, and the eastern section, the mainland. The Arctic Cathedral is front and center in this view. It was built in 1965 and its denomination is the Church of Norway. It sits on the mainland, the eastern section of Tromso. The Polar Museum celebrates all of the expeditions exploring the Arctic region in general and the North Pole in particular. It also contains a tribute to one of Norway's greatest explorers, Roald Amundsen. The museum uses dioramas to tell stories. This baby polar bear is one of the nicest. This mallet is an icebreaker from the 1930s. The crew tied a rope around a strong man, gave him the mallet, and hung him over the side of the ship. Don't tell me these guys weren't tough. Looking across the city, you can see Tromso University, the most northern university in the world, and the medical college, the tall building. The hospital treats and researches seasonal affective disorder, which causes depression-like symptoms due to the lack of sunlight during the winter months. It's a common ailment north of the Arctic Circle. These snow-packed mountains tower over Tromso Island and the Arctic Cathedral. The view west from the south end of Tromso Island is a beautiful winter scene. Day 8, Alta. Once we docked, we looked across the mouth of Alta Fjord at part of the city of Alta. I noticed that in Norway, it seems that there are outlying sections of houses physically separated from the city, but part of the metropolitan area. It reminds me of Towson in Baltimore 100 or so years ago. The Northern Lights Cathedral is in Alta. Built in 2013, it is associated with the Church of Norway. The statue of Jesus is also the cross for the sanctuary. Even on dark days, the skylight over the statue bathes it in light. The cathedral has an impressive pipe organ, and the interior is the sleek, no-frills appearance of Scandinavian style. For a small fee, people can go to the basement where there is a Northern Lights Museum as well as a game where players are scored on how well they sing with the Northern Lights. We are at the headwaters of the short Alta Fjord and the location of the Alta Museum. It's a good representation of the coastal land of Norway. It's rugged, stark, powerful, and yet, even with little color, beautiful in its own way. The grounds of the Alta Museum were inaccessible due to the snow, but inside there was plenty of rock art as well as explanations of the civilization that produced it. The hair braids on this stone are similar to Pippi Longstocking's braids in the children's story. That's why this is called the Pippi Stone. Here's something different. It's an artifact that the museum encourages visitors to touch. This is another style of rock carving. Day 9, Alta, Day 2. One of the side trips in Alta was a home visit about knitting. I wasn't too interested, but my wife is a knitter, so we both went. Fortunately for me, the knitting portion was only about 15 minutes out of two hours. The visit began with a tea party the hostess laid out for us. Besides tea, she served little sandwiches made with pancakes for bread and brown cheese. This Norwegian specialty was delicious. The three women in this picture are wearing examples of traditional Norwegian dress. The men's suits are similarly decorated. Both men's and women's versions are called a bunad. You can see how decorative they are. The clothing, along with the sterling silver buttons, belts, and pocketbooks, can be worth as much as $10,000. 
Our hostess's Boone ad is insured for $6,000. When my wife saw my pictures, she said, that's just like a man. You took pictures of the details, but not the whole dress. This is one side of the vest portion of the boonad. The fine detailing of the handwork is one of the reasons the boonads are so valuable. Often a mother will make her daughter's grown-up boonad that she receives at age 15. Depending on the amount of detail, mom must start years earlier for the boonad to be ready on time. The hem of the skirt is just as detailed. While we heard about the boonad, we learned about some of the culture of Norway. Each section county has its own patterns, and marriages, divorces, and death can change the designs a person is allowed to wear. There are now some patterns that are countrywide, not regional. We also learned how the different regions interact socially with each other. Look at the snow on this roof. You can see how deep it can get in this area, and this year was a warm winter. There are many houses and buildings painted in these yellow and red colors. The pigments for yellow and red are native to Norway. In the past, if you wanted another color, it was expensive because the paint had to be shipped from England. That's not the case now, but these colors are still very popular. Day 10, Narvik. As we approach the city, we pass several fish farms. They are usually salmon, but sometimes they're cod. This mountain towers over the Narvik port. Look closely and you can see the ski resort on top. The Ankenis Church is an octagonal wooden church built in 1842. The denomination is the Church of Norway. The photo shows two different views. The interior of the church is well kept up. While we were waiting outside, the air felt frigid to us, but several mothers pushed their young babies in strollers on their morning walks. Snowy mountains keep watch over the town. For all you history buffs, there was a lot of World War II action in all of these northern parts. As a matter of fact, when the tide in Narvik Harbor is low, the top part of a sunken warship is above the surface. There are also concrete bunkers around in various cities and locations. In one place, Tromso filled in the area between the bunkers and turned it into a playground for children. This is modern Narvik. Most of it looks like it was built in the 1960s and has never been updated. It was very dirty with what appears to be soot and ash. That probably comes from the many coal trains that come from the mines in Sweden about 25 miles away. There's one pulling into town now. The coal is processed and loaded onto ships in very large buildings at the port about two miles away. The Swedes send their coal here because the port never freezes. Narvik is the northernmost city in Norway with a railroad. Day 11 at sea. This was our fourth day at sea, so we didn't take any pictures. Day 12, Bergen. This is part of the fortifications that surround the stone Bergen Hus Fortress. The fortifications contained buildings dating back as far as the 1240s, as well as later constructions built as recently as World War II. The fortress used to be the king's residence in Bergen. Today is a location for concerts and festivals. These houses are close to the port. They are up the hill, past the factories and commercial sites that surround the port. Almost all homes and buildings in Norway are heated with electricity. Despite the cold temperatures, it's inexpensive because it's hydroelectricity produced by generating stations located near Norway's abundance of waterfalls. It's also very clean. Once the ship docked, we took a trip to see the museum and factory for the world-famous Dale of Norway sweaters. This is our last pronunciation difference. Look at the tag in the picture. It looks like Dale to us, but in Norway, it's Dali. These sweaters are part of the Olympic collection. Dali has made the sweaters for the Norwegian ski team since 1956. 
We planned on buying sweaters there, but all the styles were much too warm for Baltimore. Day 13, Bergen Day 2. This morning we walked around the tourist section of the harbor area. The area on this side of the harbor is called Brigan. This is the oldest section of the port, built after a great fire in 1702. These wooden buildings have been restored and they house shops and museums. There are alleyways to smaller shops behind the ones you see. These buildings are quite a bit newer, but built in the early 1900s, they're still over 100 years old. They house more shops and some restaurants. This set has a different look to it, but it also was built in the earliest 20th century, and they also house more shops and restaurants. We're on the other side of the tourist part of the harbor. The buildings are a mixture of old and relatively newer office and upscale shopping buildings. Who knew manhole covers could be famous? Although not as famous as the King's Palace in Oslo, these decorative covers have attained a mild celebrity status. This one shows Bergen, sailing ships, important buildings, a tram ride, and even the funicular train going to the top of the mountain. There are many variations of these manhole covers. The 7-Eleven store was a familiar sight. The Louisiana Creole Crawfish Restaurant sure seemed out of place in Bergen. We peeked down a small alley to look at the quaint buildings and storefronts before we headed to a familiar place, McDonald's. It was like home sweet home. The menu board looked familiar, but I've never heard of a McFeast. The prices are high, but food prices are high all over Norway. It rained hard all afternoon, but this was the only time on the entire trip we could take a fjord tour, so we went anyway. We spent most of the time inside the boat with some warm hot chocolate, but several times I went topside in the open air for a few minutes. That just got me wet. It didn't help the quality of my pictures. As we headed to Osterford for the tour, we passed our cruise ship. This was by far the largest settlement that we saw along the fjord. Monstrumman Strait is the narrowest part of the fjord. This snowy mountain overlooks the fjord. Notice the small red-capped lighthouse on the right. There are a lot of waterfalls along the fjord, but this twin falls was unique. As we traveled the fjord, we could see the population of the area was very low. This may look like a town or a farm, but it's not. Due to the sparse population, the county built this school area in a central location. We are approaching the town of Mo at the headwaters of the fjord. From this direction, there is a spectacular waterfalls on each end of town. This picture shows the falls on the left side from two different angles. The town of Mo is very small. The falls on the right side is very approachable. It's very, very approachable. You can reach out and touch the falling water. The boat pulls up so close that the water falls on the bow of the boat. A crew member collects water in a tub and offers the passengers a drink of very cold, very pure water. Day 14, Bergen, Day 3. It rains 240 days a year, and we were lucky that the worst rain occurred when we were on the enclosed boat for the fjord trip. The rain was spotty, so we could walk around the town some, and then took the funicular train to the top of the mountain that overlooks the city. This is the ticket house and station. Here comes the next train. You can see the entire Bergen port from the overlook. 
My wife and I really enjoyed our winter cruise to Norway and the Northern Lights. I hope you did too. Thank you for watching.